ladies and gentlemen, we'll, we'll just uh, resume. Uh, the, uh, the program has uh, the voice of Chester, and I'm sure you'll be delighted to know, uh, however belated the announcement, that he, he, he is here. Um, he's just recorded this on YouTube, and uh, it's a, uh, a toast that he proposed at a literary dinner in London, uh, following the toast proposed by Rudyard Kipling, and he pays tribute to him, um, to the Canadian Literary Society that had offered hospitality and awards to both Chesterton and Kipling, as well as many others. So uh, uh, I thought um, that's something that some of you, perhaps all of you, haven't had a chance to, to listen. We won't get... Um, there's very few visuals of Chesterton that have survived, um, plenty of still photos, but not any, any uh, video recordings, really, of, of any significance. Carlos, there's an interesting use of the word, the N-word in this, might be interesting, there's an interesting use of the N-word. Yes. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, thanks, Michael. We'll just run it for... Uh, uh, we, might, we might stop it after about seven minutes, I okay. think, Michael. I can tell you that if that's all right. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so that word is used. Yes, yes, yes. Not cool, ladies and gentlemen. You will be very naturally puzzled by my occupying any space let alone so much space in this uh, somewhat crowded but very distinguished assembly. And you will naturally ask why any words of mine need be added uh, to the uh, distinguished and beautiful words of that great veteran genius of literature uh, whom we have the honor of having with us today. as I have no kind of claim to deal with the things with which he has dealt. I uh, do not know the dominions as he knows them. I have traveled uh, here and there in the miserable character of one giving lectures, but not otherwise. And uh, uh, I have no special uh, reason uh, for claiming uh, to express a hospitality towards Canadians which would be expressed by every person in the street outside as enthusiastically as by me. Uh, so let me say then quite briefly that my reason for accepting this invitation and for being here today is quite simply a desire to return hospitality. I remember that I was received by this great Canadian Literary Society when I first appeared in the great American city where I first lectured uh, with a hospitality for which I shall never be able to give a sufficient thanks. And I think we shall all agree that whatever controversies or arguments rage about the character of what used to be called colonial life, at least the ancient human traditional virtue of hospitality uh, is there, uh, flamboyant and magnificent in a degree almost unknown in our more petite society. All I know was that the Canadian Literary Society rushed out, as it were, full of hospitality, wanting to welcome anybody uh, from England, any stray traveller. In the confusion of the moment, I was mistaken for a literary man <laughs> and, dragged, uh, and, and, and dragged him into partake uh, of that uh, glorious camaraderie. Uh, the, I didn't know what to do. I thought of trying to explain that I was a lecturer. But that wouldn't do, because some of them had been to my lecture. <laughs> uh, then, I, <laughs> then I thought, uh, 
one day say I was a journalist, but I was quite sure they could not go down. Uh, God forbid that I should commit so ghastly an error uh, as of doing what I well know to be the one unpardonable sin, a confusing for a single moment the two great commonwealths that occupy the northern continent of America. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think it is uh, true to say that the ideal uh, of a press man, that the strenuous virtue required of a journalist, is somewhat similar in Canada and in the United States. A press man means a very different sort of person from me. <laughs> One glance at me would show that I had never crashed through a skylight in order to interview a celebrity. <laughs> that I had not slid through a door that was almost shut in my face <laughs> by somebody who wanted to keep me out of his bedroom. <laughs> but I had never performed any of those things that are the glory of journalism in the great world beyond the sea. <laughs> Therefore, uh, I was, as I say, in despair, and I had to pretend to be a literary man uh, for the rest of that occasion. And I grieve that it is necessary to continue that pretense, uh, uh, even at this brief luncheon hour. Uh, and uh, one of the first necessities of the pretense, of course, is to talk about things you do not understand. Mm. One of which is Canada, <laughs> so far as I am concerned. But may I say this, in addition to having experienced what uh, no, nobody, uh, not a dog or cat, and hardly a vegetable, could fail to appreciate uh, the magnificent cordiality and courtesy of the comedians considered as hosts, uh, I had also seen, brief as was my visit, something else, and that was Canada. I've been twice in Canada, once about 12 years ago, when I merely crossed the border from America. It was in the earlier days of Prohibition. <laughs> it gives me a peculiar sense of gratification that though I, who have said almost as much in abuse of the British Empire, all British uh, government, as Mr. Kipling has said in praise of them. Uh, it is, I'm still, I'm glad to say enough of an Englishman to say that it gives me a glow of pride to think that twice in the same hundred years men have escaped from the American Republic to Canada to find freedom. <laughs> It's probably probably enough. Just as a Very bit of cool. bit of a teaser, yeah. um, it's available on YouTube anyhow for anybody who'd like to hear the whole uh, speech. And there, there are uh, other um, uh, rather short pieces available there uh, as well. Um, so as I said, unfortunately, a remarkable amount of uh, Chesterton's material, including the broadcasts that he made for the BBC in his closing years, he was a very popular radio broadcaster, uh, and he died um, in 1936, uh, and as far as I can tell, um, very, very little of that has uh, survived, it wasn't archived at the time, so um, we, uh, what, what fragments there are, um, that's, that, that is one of them. So thank, thank you very much for that, thank you Michael for, for doing that, we might uh, just move on to the... Um, to the, to the next paper, and uh, Edmund O'Donovan has kindly consented to uh, make the introduction. Yes, Carl, Carl felt it was not appropriate for him to introduce his own paper, which is, is, a, is a rare sign of humility <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on, on Carl's part. Now, for people who don't know me, my name's Edmund O'Donovan. 
Uh, I'm associated with Carl. Uh, we're both on the board at Camping College here. Um, and Carl kindly invited me to, um, uh, to, to, to introduce him, a, a man at this conference who really requires no introduction. When, when I arrived here, uh, one, one of the uh, alumni asked me if I was a great Chesterton fan, and I, I, had, to, I had to think for a minute, and I thought the best reply is I'm not a fanatic. Um, which is always the accusation of anybody who actually knows something about uh, things. So, so I'm not a Chesterton fanatic, um, but, and to be asked to say anything at a Chesterton conference in, with a number of the people in the audience here um, who perhaps might be described as fanatics is, is a bit daunting. So it was nice for me to see um, Damien, um, <coughs> sorry, Stephen McInerney up the back there when he got up also feeling a little uncomfortable talking here. So I, I appreciated that, Stephen, that, uh, that, that, that you did that. Um, of the little Cheston that I have read, one of, one of the, uh, the, the first things I read was a uh, biography of um, St Francis of Assisi because I thought it would be helpful to know something about this wonderful man. Uh, unfortunately, when I finished the biography, I knew nothing more about the man than, and, than when I began. Cheston never seemed to confuse... <coughs> the need for facts and dates. And, and so by the time I finished, I wasn't even sure what century he'd lived in. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I did have some understanding of why he was such uh, an enormous figure in the, in the last uh, couple of thousand years. And uh, the Encyclopaedia Britannica can fill you in on the facts and the dates and whatever, and Chesterton gives a different idea of that. So that's the sort of introduction I want to give to Carr. He handed me a nice, I was born here, I spent this amount of time and what, but uh, I, I, I don't think that would be very helpful in, in introducing the person that it is. Uh, I, I had uh, put together a few thoughts uh, uh, during the week after Carl asked me this and I was going to start by saying that the, the reason Carl's a great Chesterton fan publicly is because he's not allowed to be a Karl Marx fan <laughs> oh, sorry, a, a, a Groucho the, the, other, the other form of Marx is because if he gets in moving in that direction his wife will either kill him or leave him um, and so I'm very surprised Carl to hear that you are actually you're going to speak about the Marx Brothers in your wife's presence and is this a way of easing yourself out of the Chesterton Society yes, <laughs> yes by, by, by raising that um, for it so but, but yes when it goes to humour and, and, and Carl Schmuder the uh, Marx Brothers uh, generally not, not to my knowledge can be left out of it can they Virginia no and hopefully not too many puns, Carl. You started off with one this morning, but um, just, just, you know, not, not, not too many. <laughs> Carl's parents met the day before they were married for the first time. Um, uh, it's, it's, the story's a bit longer than that, but that was actually a fact, that, uh, and it, it all seemed to work out, so long court, courtships and whatever clearly aren't uh, part of it. Carl was brought up living in Kirribilli House, which um, uh, he, he recounts the story of when he saw Sound of Music and they're living in this castle and then he drove home in his old beat-up Volkswagen down the gates and the gravel <coughs> pathways of Kirribilli House. And again, that's another story, but it's a magnificent... The idea of the appreciation of things that have been left behind, I'm sure, came to Carl as a, as, 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 as a young person and a young man. He studied and worked as a librarian for a considerable period of time, uh, before he got involved in, well, I, th I think his involvement in Camping College really has been the whole work of his life for uh, even for the 20 years or 30 years before it actually uh, came to fruition. Uh, and during that period, uh, the, he was a member of the, the Campion Fellowship by the time that Carl got to it. Um, and he, he really, as a... As, uh, not the right thing, and it's sort of an incidental lay person, as in he hasn't been head of a university or whatever, just as, as, as quite a private person has taken a very big stand uh, over several decades, uh, what I say is to, to shine the light uh, and keep, keep the flame burning when it could easily have gone out. When I first became involved with Campion, um, um, <laughs> one of my brothers remembered... Uh, a Carl Schmuder that used to write in the Catholic Weekly and had a, a fairly uh, long and torrid exchange with a liberal Dominican, 
was it? Yes, yes. Anyway, Carl is saying that, yes, God does still exist and sort of things along those lines that weren't all that popular to be, to be saying at the time. Um, the, and the, the culmination, I think, of Carl's work uh, through this, this intellectual um, uh, tr tradition, which is the Campion, uh, the, the Campion Fellowship, um, and then on to having seen what had been done in America to actually forming um, and founding Campion College. There are other people involved, uh, but one of the other key players, he always said, no Carl, no Campion. Uh, and the fact that uh, this intellectual tradition can, can grow and move on um, is really a, 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 a great credit to you, mm. Carl. Mm. Um, one of the other people involved... Seriously, in its founding, is sitting quietly there in the in the second back seat. Um, he, this is Cardinal Pell, and it's so nice to see you here. Um, he was a tremendous supporter uh, when when we when we needed when we needed serious support, and has uh, remained that um, since the conferences on on humour in Chesterton. Um, I, I, I hope that your eminence's sense of humour can um, <coughs> withstand the, uh, the the difficulties that go ahead, and you understand you have our best wishes in, in, in all of that. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Carl, I shall allow you to give your talk on. Passing it on, please. <coughs> I'm going to be quoting as various uh, speakers have today uh, from Chesterton, and I thought it might be helpful if I just put together uh, various quotes, particularly the longer ones, uh, so that people can have them and can refer to them if they wish. Thank you very much, Edmund, for those kind words and the warnings about my uh, marital future. Um, it is, I, I'm sure it will survive this afternoon, but nonetheless, I take those warnings to heart. Let me begin, ladies and gentlemen, with a familiar Chesterton quote. The human race, to which so many of my readers belong... <laughs> now, this is the opening line, as many of you will recognise, of Chesterton's novel, The Napoleon of Notting Hill published in 1904, and has often been quoted as a piece of playful nonsense. Yet it could almost pass for a line from a Marx Brothers movie. Groucho Marx, in particular, lifted frivolousness and inanity to a new level of intellectual cleverness. Most of his remarks were more absurd and certainly crueler than anything Chesterton ever said. Just some samples. You've got the brain of a four-year-old boy, and I bet he was glad to get rid of her. <laughs> she got her looks from her father. He's a plastic surgeon. <laughs> I've had a perfectly wonderful evening, but this wasn't it. <laughs> As he said about one of his brothers one time, he may look like an idiot and talk like an idiot, but don't let that fool you. He really is an idiot. <laughs> and as a librarian, I guess this appeals to me, I'm sure it will appeal to Gary, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> now these statements sound nonsensical, but the fact that nonsense can make us laugh says something, I think something profound, about our human nature. Chesterton himself dealt with this in one of his earliest writings as a journalist. In 1901, he published his first work of prose, a book of essays called The Defendant, in which he brought together a series of defences of ordinary things, ordinary realities, that are often overlooked or ridiculed, Essays such as A Defence of Penny Dreadfuls, A Defence of Rash Vows, A Defence of Skeletons. 
Now, one essay in this volume is entitled A Defence of Nonsense. And I'd like to reflect on key parts of his argument, which bear very much on humour, it seems to me. In the first place, he argues that nonsense is an essential part of human understanding. It's connected with the world of poetry and allegory, allegory and provides a balance to the world of reason. It's important to stress that this is not an assertion of irrationalism on Chesterton's part, an argument against reason. Rather, it's an argument for the things that transcend reason, that balance reason, that keep reason in its proper place of importance, but not of exclusive supremacy that leads to distorted understanding. In short, I think Chesterton is speaking of nonsense, not anti-sense. Now, in this essay, he, note, he looks at the history of what he calls the literature of nonsense. He notes that some of the world's greatest writers, such as Aristophanes and Rabelais, engaged in such writing, but he characterises this as the instinct of satire, rather than, in the strict sense, the instinct of nonsense. That is, they took the features of a particular person and exaggerated them for symbolic effect. By contrast with nonsense, which for no particular reason, Chesterton said, imagines those features on another person. Chesterton himself engaged in satire on many occasions, especially in the cause of Catholic apologetics. For example, he produced an imaginary interview to satirise popular intellectuals like H.G. Wells, who, as uh, Gary was referring to in Wells's outline of history, um, showed a naive, for, it was John, I think, uh, sorry, John, uh, mentioned and, and spoke about the outline of history. Um, Wells showed a naive belief in evolution as supplanting any faith in the Bible. So Cheston's imaginary interview began by recording, and I quote, the recently discovered traces of an actual historical flood, a discovery which has shaken the Christian world to its foundation by its apparent agreement with the book of Genesis. It's Mr H.G. Wells exclaimed, I am interested in the flood of the future, not in any of these little local floods that may have taken place in the past. I want a broader, larger, more complete and coordinated sort of flood a flood that will really cover the whole ground. Après moi, le déluge. Belloc, in his boorish, boozy way, may question my knowledge of French, but I fancy that quotation will settle him. Well, in the course of his Defence of Nonsense essay, Chesterton points out that the idea behind nonsense is that of escape. Not from something, not escape from something, but as he puts it, to something. In fact, an escape into a world, as he says, where things are not fixed horribly in an eternal appropriateness. Now, could we find a more appropriate word for our times than the overused word appropriate, or even more inappropriate? It seems to me this general insight of Chesterton's touches on the nature of the Marx Brothers' humour. Their humour has often been characterised as bringing chaos to an apparently fixed order. And yet their humour, I think, is in essence an attack on the falsity of that order, reinforced as it was by pomposity and complacency, by snobbery and hypocrisy. Nobody, as one critic said, could unstuff a stuffed shirt more quickly and more completely than Groucho Marx. The British journalist Bernard Levin once commented, when Harpo Marx eats the lighted candle, the thermometer, the telephone, the cups and saucers, when Chico double crosses everybody at once, when Groucho flings his restaurant bill before a beautiful stranger with the cry, this is an outrage, if I were you I wouldn't pay it. <laughs> They are loosening the bonds that bind society. And in doing so, loosening the bonds that bind us in the audience, that inhibit us from total surrender to their assaults on reason, logic, propriety and the language. When the bonds are released, Bernard Levin went on, that surrender 
takes place. There were no, more, no lukewarm admirers of the Marx Brothers, and anyone who finds them funny at all has also at times found himself physically helpless and almost ill with laughter. Now, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I thought I'd pay a short uh, two clips, really. They're together from two movies. Uh, the first is called The Night at the Opera, which I based the horrible pun in the title. Uh, and all the Marx Brothers are trapped in a stateroom, a very small room, on a liner that's sailing to, um, uh, from, from New York, I think. Um, and uh, Groucho is the only one who's recorded as being in this room, but in fact there are various other people, the two other brothers, Chico and uh, Groucho, uh, and um, Harper, and uh, a further stowaway, a singer played by Alan Jones, not our Alan Jones. Uh, that's the first clip. Uh, the second one is from Go West, and it's a scene in a stagecoach where the three Marx brothers have a number of different uh, people as uh, fellow passengers. And what it highlights, I think, among other things, is that in virtually every Marx Brothers movie, there is at least one scene that uh, is just seemingly such utter chaos, with Groucho doing all of the verbal uh, wisecracking, Chico fracturing the English language, uh, and Harpo just generally, as the, as the mute in the, in the movie, in the scene, is just um, visually creating uh, chaos. So many of you will have seen these before perhaps, but I thought that but both these encapsulate it. Uh, and we might just watch them now, uh, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind helping me there. Thanks, Michael. two post eggs, two scrambled eggs, and two medium boiled eggs. And two hard boiled eggs. And two hard boiled eggs. Make that three hard boiled eggs. <laughs> and uh, some roast beef, rare, medium, well done, and overdone. And two hard boiled eggs. And two hard boiled eggs. <laughs> Make that three hard boiled eggs. And uh, eight pieces of French pastry. There's two hard boiled eggs. And two hard boiled eggs. <laughs> Make that three hard boiled eggs. And one duck egg. Uh, have you got any stewed prunes? Yes, sir. Well, give them some black coffee. That'll sober them up. And two hard boiled eggs. And two hard boiled eggs. It's either party out or make that 12 more hard boiled eggs. And Stuart, rush that along, because the faster it comes, the faster this convention will be over. Yes, sir. Do they allow tipping on the boat? Oh, yes, sir. Have you got two fives? Yes, sir. Well, then you won't need the ten cents I was going to give you. <laughs> Fine. That Stuart is deaf and dumb. You'll never know you're in here. Oh, I'm sure that's all right. Yes? We've come to make up your room. Are those my hard-boiled eggs? I can't tell until they get in the room. Come on in, girls, and leave all hope behind. But you've got to wait fast because you've got to get out in ten minutes. Hey, Tomato, wake up and they want to fix the bed. Say, uh, I'd like two pillows on that bed there, huh? All right, bring it. Say, there's a slight misunderstanding here. I said the girls had to wake fast, not your friend. Who's <laughs> still asleep? You know, he does better asleep than I do awake. Yeah, he always sleeps that way. Now he's half asleep. Yes, he's half asleep and half Nelson. <laughs> All right, come yes? on. Yes? I'm the engineer. I'm going to turn off the heat. Well, you can start riding on him. Wake up, Tomasa. Tomasa, we're going to eat soon. You know, if it wasn't for gut leave, I wouldn't have got this room. Just hold him there a second. Yes? Did you want a manicure? No, come on in. <laughs> I haven't planned on a manicure, but I think on a journey like this, you ought to have every convenience you can get. Hey, listen, I'm getting the manicure. Get out of here, will you? Did you want your nails long or short? You better make them short. It's getting kind of crowded when you're done. <laughs> I don't know. This isn't the way I pictured an ocean voyage. 
I always visualize myself sitting in a steamer chair with a steward bringing me bouillon. Come on, Ricardo. You couldn't get any bouillon in here unless they brought it in through a keyhole. I'm the engineer's assistant. You know, I had a premonition you were going to show up. <laughs> hey, it's right over there in the corner. You can chop your way right through. Say, is it my imagination or is it getting crowded here? Yeah. Well, I got plenty of room. Yes? Why is he in here? Well, you can come in and prowl around if you want. But if he isn't in here, you can probably find somebody just as good. Well, could I use your phone? Use the phone? I'll let you even money you can't get in the room. This phone will be in New York before you can get to that phone. I came to mop up. Just the woman I'm looking for. Come right ahead. You let the start on the ceiling. It's the only place that isn't being occupied. Tell Aunt May to send up a bigger room, too, will you? Ah, come right ahead. Hey, come on. 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 That's only a mirage coming. I'm going to look like you in a few days. <laughs> Where did I see your face before? Right where it is now. <laughs> Funny? How would you like to buy a diamond necklace that formerly belonged to the Tsarina of Russia? How did you get it? I used to room with Rasputin. One dollar. I'll buy it. Let me ten dollars. Why, sure. Hello? Ten dollars. Nine dollars change, please. Let's forget about it. Anna, why is that baby constantly crying? He can't stand the jerks in the coach. <laughs> Woo! Ten dollars for every bit you hit. I'm so sorry. I'm so straight in the world. I just rustled the rock. My muscles go. Not in there, boy. Here. I can fix this muscle. All right, I'm just helping you there. That's not my business, but are you wearing a revolving door? If you are, I'd like to go around with you sometime. Now then, uh, Mr. Pinello, instead of bargaining with you for the rights of the land, I intend to make you a liberal offer, which I feel you'll instantly accept. How much are you going to pay us for this land? Five hundred dollars? I want to be it. Now, all I need is both your signatures. Oh, uh, on the bottom. On the bottom. <laughs> I'll give you a thousand dollars. How dare you, you meddlesome fool? I heard that. If you weren't smaller than me, I'd flog the daylights out of it. But I'm bigger than you. Well, that's another reason. <laughs> you want to pay us twice as much for this land as the railroad? Yes, and it's a lucky thing for you I got here in time. Mr. Pinell, you don't even know who he represents. At least you know my offer is bona fide. That's right. How do we know your offer is bona fide? Huh? Are your hands clean? Sure. And here's my card. Bona fide oil company. That's quit and quail, friends. And look, there's a whole company as a bona fide. In all my long business experience, I've dealt with every important oil firm. And I've never heard of your company. You haven't. Evidently, you don't read the bankruptcy notices. <laughs> well, it works out fine. We get your land, you get $1,000, and our friend here gets bounced by the railroad for letting this oily deal slip through his greasy fingers. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's more than your land is worth, really, but... Well, I'll stretch a point. Fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred dollars? Oh, boy! Hey, stop it. Fifteen hundred dollars, I write good. Two thousand, three, four, five, six thousand dollars. See, he says six thousand. What do you say? I've washed my hands of this whole deal. Well, try this soap. We're having a special on it today. It's a dollar and eight for two pence per quart. Oh, where's my bag? Now, gentlemen, please get me. Give me my hand. Where's my hand? Where is my hand? There it is. Here's yours. Gentlemen, I have a whole railroad on my shoulder.
Go to the side. Let's get something done. I want my hat. Oh, you have my hat. Here's your hat. Have you a father's hand, please? I've got to get a contract signed. Where is it? All right, if I take my hat. I've never been on a trip like this before. Where is it, anyway? Who has my bus? Sit in your own seat, will you please? I'll be glad to get in my own seat. Well, Mr. Beecher, no hard feelings, huh? Wait, Camilla, wait. I'll admit you've got me in hot water. Please. Why don't you let me get this sign? Where's my hat? Here, here. They're the only clips that I am showing, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So. Well, turning back to um, Chesterton's essay, A Defence of Nonsense, he further notes that nonsense emanates from an ordered world of moral realism. An ordered world of moral realism. It's not a mere aesthetic fancy or fantasy or a personal rep preference. It relies on a rich moral soil for its development. And this is what he says. Every great literature has always been allegorical, allegorical of some view of the whole universe. The Iliad, he says, is only great because all life is a battle. The Odyssey, because all life is a journey. The Book of Job, because all life is a riddle. It is significant, he goes on, that in the greatest religious poem existent, the book of Job, the argument which convinces the infidel is not, as has been represented by the merely rational religionism, as he calls it, the merely rational religionism of the 18th century. What convinces the infidel is not a picture of the ordered beneficence of the creation, but on the contrary, a picture of the huge and undecipherable unreason of it. He offers a similar argument in his great study of Christian anthropology, The Everlasting Man. There he argues that to understand the Christian view of nature, it's best to be inside Christendom as a believing Christian. But the next best thing is to be really outside it. For example, someone like Confucius. Rather than being in the position of popular critics of Christianity in the West, who occupy a kind of halfway house, they live in the shadow of the faith, in intensifying darkness, they live off its spiritual capital, they draw on its moral heritage, but they no longer believe it. And it's no longer sustainable as the bedrock of our culture. Thus, the alternative to a sane vision of man, Chesterton proposes, is actually a mad vision. That is, seeing man as a strange animal. And then as you work through the apparent equivalence of man and animal, you realise that to regard man as an animal makes clear that he is not an animal, that he has a unique nature, a soul, a spiritual sensibility, a spiritual yearning, free will, a power of speech, a capacity to draw and to paint that marks him out entirely from that of the animal. So to turn to Chesterton's great work of Christian sociology, What's Wrong with the World, there's another commonly quoted statement that seems like an echo of the Marx Brothers, and it's already been mentioned today. If a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now, this is not nonsense, I think, but actually something else, namely paradox. The idea that truth is best understood as a single reality comprised of a balance between apparently competing and even conflicting truths. This balance can be tense and is certainly dynamic, and the effect can seem a contradiction and even an absurdity. So in the case of 
if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Chesterton is saying, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing because it's important and worthwhile, even if we don't do it well, even if we do it badly. This applies, as Chesterton made clear, to the most important things most ordinary people do, such as marriage, parenting, work and friendship. And even if we do them poorly and imperfectly, which everyone does, they're worth doing. You may recall the story of the uh, British comedy writer Frank Muir, who died a few years ago, who heard this quote, if the thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly, uh, quoted by Prince Charles in his maiden speech in the House of Lords. And Prince Charles unfortunately attributed uh, the quote to Oscar Wilde. And uh, Frank Muir, who knew, knew, knew his Chesterton, was, uh, was very upset by this. And in his autobiography called A Kentish Lad, he recalls it. And he says, ascribing this quote to Wilde suggested it was nothing more than a witty bon mot. One of those amusing Wildian inversions, such as work is the curse of the drinking classes. But coming from Chesterton, Muir goes on, meant it was a more thoughtful observation. In Chesterton's work, his humour arose from a serious thought. What Chesterton was saying in a piece about playing croquet was that playing a game simply because you enjoyed playing it, perhaps hoping to get better at it in time, is a worthy enough reason for playing it, however badly. So he was in a tetchy mood, was Frank Muir, and uh, he telephoned the London Times, and he left a message uh, for the editor of the diary column, explaining how important he felt it was that the quotation was given its pro proper author. Well, next morning, the Times appeared. They put the Prince's uh, maiden speech in the House of Lords on the front page, and it began last night, the Prince of Wales began his maiden speech, etc. And then there was an asterisk. And at the bottom of the page was his twin asterisk. And in nasty black type, it said, Mr Frank Muir pointed out last night that the Prince had opened his speech with a misquotation. The line was not written by Oscar Wilde, but by G.K. Chesterton. Other newspapers then began telephoning for follow-up stories. Worse happened, says Muir, a year or so later, he said, I found myself in the crystal room of London's exclusive Grosvenor House Hotel, having pre-dinner drinkies with the formidable committee who were mounting the evening's ball. And also speaking that night was the Duke of Edinburgh. Muir found himself seated beside the Duke in a, uh, in a quiet order of the, uh, corner of the room. And uh, he thought he needed to say something. So he said, oh, sir, he said to Prince uh, Philip, I feel I must apologise for correcting the Prince of Wales on the misquotation of his, in his maiden speech to the Lords. But, sir, I felt rather strongly about it. You see, sir, it wasn't a joke, but a philosophy which I happen to agree with. It's the opposite view to the American cult of winner-take-all. If your child does not come top of the class, does that mean that it is a useless human being? No, of course not. He warmed to his theme. The Duke closed his eyes several times, presumably in order to concentrate, Frank thought, <laughs> on what he was saying. And as he talked on, Frank Muir remembered that both uh, Prince Philip and Prince Charles had been to stern Gordon Stone School, where it was rumoured pupils who did not get among the top three in exams were shot. <laughs> <laughs> Only a slight wound in a fleshy part of the thigh. I understood, but still. After something like a quarter of an hour, I brought my little apology to a close, he said, laughingly. Anyway, sir, I would have thought the blithering idiot who gave Prince Charles the quotation oh, no. would have had the nouse to check it first. <laughs> the Duke looked at me levelly. I gave him the quotation. <laughs> Muir always said that's why he never received a gong. <laughs> he was never made Sir Frank. <laughs> now, Chesterton thought uh, that the history of heresies 
of intellectual mistakes with enormous religious and social and political consequences, Stephen touched on this earlier today, reveal the importance and value of paradox. Heresies consist of emphasising one truth at the expense of another, plucking one truth, as it were, out of the treasury of truths and making it the whole truth. The tendency reflects an inability to keep two truths alive at the same time without diluting or denying them. The result of isolating one truth and making it the whole truth disturbs the delicate balance of truths. And it's this which leads to the intellectual error that is heresy. In other words, heresy begins with truth, but it ends with the denial of truth. Just that it illustrates what he means in the central chapter of orthodoxy, his great apologia of faith. And there he explains that the truths about God and man are best expressed in paradox. That reconciling, for example, the justice of God with the mercy of God should be done not simply by combining them, which is likely to mean diluting them, reducing them to a long, lowest common denominator, but rather by combining them, in Chesterton's words, uh, as furious opposites, keeping them both, said Chesterton, and keeping them both furious. So he took the virtue of courage, for example, and he pointed out the paradox at the centre of courage, that it means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. Corresponding to Christ's words, that he that will lose his life, the same shall save it. In a similar way, modesty as the balance, to quote Chesterton's words, between mere pride and mere prostration, modesty is founded on the truth, enshrined in the Christian faith, that man has been exalted by his being made in the image and likeness of God, and yet humbled by the weakness of sin and the chronic misuse of his freedom. This touches very much on what Gary was talking about earlier. As Chesterton put it, insofar as I am man, I am the chief of creatures. Insofar as I am a man, I am the chief of sinners. Now, just as paradox was such, such an essential part of Chesterton's outlook, I think it pinpoints a key element in the humour of the Marx Brothers, namely their embrace and embodiment of paradox. For the Marx Brothers, this usually took the form of declaring one truth or an expectation founded on a truth and then overturning it with another. A couple of examples of the Marx Brothers combining and then shattering truths to produce a humorous paradox. When they appeared on Broadway, before they really got into movies, one of the younger Marx brothers came to Groucho on the stage and said, Dad, the garbage man is here. And Groucho answered, tell him we don't want any. <laughs> so there is the familiar call about somebody's arrived at the door who's performing a service, would create the expectation to respond by putting out the garbage. But no. It's upended by an answer that puts the garbage man into the same category as the milkman or the mailman or anyone else who delivers rather than collects something. Another example. Groucho receives a report from an official who expresses the hope that the report is clear. Clear, says Groucho? Why, a four-year-old child could understand this. Run out and find me a four-year-old child. I can't make head or tail of it. <laughs> Again, we have the conventional statement of promise that even a child could understand this, which is then dashed by Groucho's repost. So we have this combination, I think, of a truism that we can understand followed by an unexpected reversal, almost a statement of nonsense in the Chestertonian sense of something that's outside of or beyond reason. That's not irrational, but is paradoxical. It involves a mixture and balance of truths that represent an assertion of reality with an acceptance of mystery. It's reminiscent of um, the paradoxical plea of a, a modern Jewish philosopher who said, why, why is God making me suffer so much just because I don't believe in him? <laughs> 
So as I ponder the humour of the Marx Brothers, I see it as a kind of comical counterpart to, and even a comical extension of, the serious paradoxes that Chesterton found in creation. Well, let me move to just another dimension of humour that Chesterton and the Marx Brothers shared, I think, and that is the place and importance of exaggeration. We may immediately shrink from such a notion that exaggeration is something positive, something to be valued, Shouldn't we be resisting moderation? Shouldn't we be prizing uh, exaggeration? Sorry, shouldn't we be resisting exaggeration? Shouldn't we be prizing moderation? Chesterton argued that exaggeration was a sign of a healthy human life and a healthy culture. In his book on Charles Dickens, still regarded as one of the classic studies of Dickens, Chesterton uh, said that exaggeration is an index of how much we believe in something and in that sense, care about it. It's only the things we doubt, he said, what we don't believe in or don't feel strongly about that causes mildness and a sedateness bordering on passivity, virtually a state of indifference. He says, for we are all exact and scientific on the subjects we do not care about. But the moment we begin to believe a thing ourselves, that moment we begin easily to overstate it. And the moment our souls become serious, our words become a little wild. A further aspect of exaggeration, relevant, I think, to the humour of both Chesterton and the Marx Brothers, is Chesterton's insight into the qualities, the differences in the quality of humour between America and England. And by extension, I think, the quality of humour in Australia. He thought that the essential difference between American and English humour lay in this, that American humour involves a building up, a huge exaggerating of reality, what he calls a soaring imagination piling one house on another in a tower like that of a skyscraper. By contrast, English humour involves a putting down, relying on a sort of bathos and anti-climax for its effect. Both exaggerate, one upwards, the other downwards. One ballooning reality, the other deflating reality. Both derive their comical energy from exaggeration. The American, as Chesterton pointed out, making life more wild and impossible than it is, and the Englishman making it more flat and farcical than it is. Well, that might provide a topic for discussion later, perhaps especially in relation to Australian humour. Now, a final issue I'd like to canvas is the spiritual significance of humour. Can we link the experience of laughter with the deepest part of our nature? Might we even suggest that humour has a salvific effect and is a benefit for our souls? At a natural level, laughter certainly involves an enormous and unrivalled release. I recall my dad's uh, memory of coming out of a theatre, movie uh, theatre in the early 1930s, in the depth of the Great Depression, having watched a Marx Brothers movie, and feeling liberated in company with so many others, and vindicated, and almost redeemed. At last... Those who had inflicted this suffering on us were being repaid by being mocked and put in their place. How special it was to have one or two hours of hilarious assaults on the power of the proudly complacent, the false authority and greed of those who had inflicted such misery. This sort of highlighted some of the characters in those clips, I think. Yet the benefits of humour can rise above the natural to the supernatural. They acquire spiritual significance, and they have spiritual roots, which Chesterton explains in his writings, and the Marx Brothers enact in their movies. In various essays, Chesterton makes clear the spiritual sources of humour, and the extent to which it's impossible to understand laughter without some kind of spiritual vision some kind of religious doctrine, without, in fact, a belief in God. Now, he doesn't propose that we might add the argument from humour 
to the five ways of St Thomas Aquinas so that a further proof of the existence of God could now be proffered, amplifying St Thomas's other arguments from motion and causation and design and so on. Chesterton doesn't propose this additional proof as a sixth way, but in effect he makes a compelling case for it. In one essay, for example, he highlights a connection between the humorous condition of human beings and the serious truth of original sin. Forgive the pun at the end. Unless a thing is dignified, he says, it cannot be undignified. Why is it funny that a man should sit down suddenly in the street? There is only one possible or intelligent reason, that man is the image of God. It is not funny that anything else should fall down, only that a man should fall down. No one sees anything funny in a tree falling down. No one sees a delicate absurdity in a stone falling down. No man stops in the road and roars with laughter at the sight of the snow falling down. The fall of thunderbolts is treated with some gravity. The fall of roofs and high buildings is taken seriously. It is only when a man tumbles down that we laugh. Why do we laugh? <coughs> asked Chesterton. Because it is a grave religious matter. It is the fall of man. Only man can be absurd, for only man can be dignified. End of quote. Thus there is this gap, not only a tragic gap, but a funny gap, between what we were made to be, creatures infused with the dignity of God, and destined for an eternal life with him, and what we are, creatures who are proud and pretentious and constantly seeking to make gods of ourselves. It's this gap, this contrast and incongruity between our human nature and our divine destiny that is so hilariously funny. It's incidentally in uh, the same essay, which was in the book All Things Considered, an essay called Spiritualism, that Chesterton uttered one of his most famous lines about humour and religion. He proposes that matters of the greatest seriousness should not simply be discussed seriously, but also humorously, or as he puts it, grotesquely. If a subject is of universal importance, you should not explain or defend it only with serious terms and outstanding examples. You should also explain it by reference to the ordinary and apparently unnoticed and undistinguished. So if you have, let us say, a theory about human nature, Chesterton argues that you shouldn't try to prove it simply by citing Plato and George Washington, but by, he says, talking about the butler or the postman. It is the test, he goes on, of a responsible religion or theory whether it can take examples from pots and pans and boots and butter tubs. It's a test of a good philosophy, whether you can defend it grotesquely. And his closing sentence is the off-quoted one. It's a test of a good religion, whether you can joke about it. In another essay, Chesterton discusses the nature of jokes, and he stresses that they are essentially silly and senseless. There is no point, says Chesterton, in saying that a joke is silly. All jokes are silly. That is what they are for. There's no point, he continues, in objecting to senseless jokes. The very definition of a joke, he notes, is that it need have no sense. Except, he elaborates, except that one wild and supernatural sense, which we call the sense of humour. Humour, he says, is meant in a literal sense to make game of man. That is, to dethrone him from his official dignity and hunt him like a game. It's meant to remind us human beings that we have things about us as ungainly and ludicrous as the nose of the elephant or the neck of the giraffe. If laughter does not touch a sort of fundamental folly, it does not do its duty in bringing us back to an enormous and original simplicity. Nothing has been worse, says Chesterton, than the modern notion that a clever man can make a joke without taking part in it without sharing in the general absurdity that such a situation creates. It is unpardonable conceit not to laugh at your own jokes. 
something I've never been guilty of, fortunately. <laughs> J- joking is undignified. That is why it is so good for one's soul. Now, as this statement implies, Chesterton saw humour as an answer to pride. In one essay, he calls it the chief antidote to pride. And in another place, he offers a distinction between a smile and a laugh, making clear, unsurprisingly, he always favours laughing. Laughter, he says, has something in it in common with the ancient winds of faith and inspiration. It unfreezes pride and unwinds secrecy. It makes men forget themselves in the presence of something greater than themselves. In his last great book, The Everlasting Man, 1925, Lachiston tended not to write great books, I think, in that definitive sense, but to throw away his insights in all sorts of unremembered places, which is why it's so hard very often to find uh, and identify the sources of quotations. But in The Everlasting Man, he pinpointed the unique quality of human beings as animals who are funny. I quoted this uh, statement at the beginning of the conference, but I think it bears repeating. Alone among the animals, he said, man is shaken with the beautiful madness called laughter. Now, when we consider how Walt Disney and others over the years have made animals funny, uh, David Daintree touched on this earlier, in cartoons and animated movies, it's only because they have projected them as essentially human-like. Animals are only funny when they are depicted and perceived as human beings. They're not funny as animals. They're only funny as human proxies. They're only funny when we project them as human-like. They then bear the mark, the eternal status and dignity, of creatures with a particular purpose designed by God. Human creatures, or animal creatures when they're portrayed as human, only become ridiculous because they are first and foremost invested with dignity. When they betray the dignity with which God invested them, when they do not use properly the free will which elevated them as human beings, then they become funny. Their pride is rebuked. But before this, their divine condition is affirmed. And so it is, at the supernatural level, laughter rises to the heights of paradise. Whether there will be laughter in paradise, we can reasonably conclude, I think, that laughter prepares us for paradise. Well, let me turn now, finally, to the fur- a further spiritual aspect of humour, and that is the religious sources of the Marx Brothers humour. For I think these represent, to a large extent, the deepest roots of their humour. The Marx Brothers were Jewish, and living in a small Jewish neighbourhood in New York City in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they were surrounded by non-Jewish peoples, in particular Irish and German and Italian, uh, who were primarily Catholic. A reason, for example, why Chico Marx sounded like an Italian immigrant in New York was because he recognised that the Italians ran the neighbourhood in which the Marx family lived and he adopted an Italian accent so that he'd be more readily accepted. I think it's instructive to ponder the ways in which their religious traditions and perspectives influence their humour. The Jewish people, after all, have had an enormous impact on humour, contributing more to the humour of the 20th century and our own lives than anyone else. The history of movies in particular has been hugely shaped by the Jewish people. All of the big studios, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Warner Brothers, Fox, Paramount, were founded by Jews and a huge proportion of the big name comedians have been of Jewish background. It's been estimated that while only a small proportion of Americans are Jewish, about 2%, 80%, 80% of major American comics have been Jewish. Some of them have been named today. We think of Woody Allen. Mel Brooks, Jack Benny, Danny Kaye, Walter Matthau, Sid Caesar, Milton Berle, Phil Silvers, Jerry Seinfeld, and of course, the Marx Brothers. Now we can compare this tradition with the Catholic heritage in Hollywood, and the presence of comedians 
of Catholic background. I'm thinking of Jackie Gleason, Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Danny Thomas, Bob Newhart, Mary Tyler Moore, and Bob Hope, though he was not a born Catholic, but a convert. There have been times where these traditions have come together. For example, the Marx Brothers movie Duck Soup was brought to the screen by a well-known Catholic director, Leo McCary, who made such well-known movies with Catholic themes, some of you may remember, such as Going My Way and The Bells of St Mary's with Bing Crosby, another Catholic actor. Similarly, if we look at primetime TV series, for example, Hogan's Heroes and M.A.S.H., we encounter Catholic actors, such as Bob Crane, who played the part of Colonel Hogan, and Jewish comedians, like Werner Klemperer, who played the part of Colonel Klink, and the actors who starred as Sergeant Schultz, General Burkholder, and even the little French prisoner, Lebeau, all Jewish. In M.A.S.H., the TV series was created by the brilliant Jewish scriptwriter Larry Gelbart, who wrote many of the episodes, while the actors, such as Alan Alder, Mike Farrell and Loretta Swit, Major Hot Lips, Houlihan, were Catholic. And the Jewish scriptwriters created a Catholic priest as one of the characters, Father John Patrick Francis Mulcahy. It just sounds faintly Irish. <laughs> So Hogan's Heroes and M.A.S.H. are a great testimony, I think, to the pervasive power of the Judeo-Christian tradition. What's distinctive about Jewish humour? I suppose the most remarkable thing about it is that in the light of their history of suffering and persecution, most horribly the Holocaust, they would seem to have the least to laugh about. They could almost have invented the line, humour is nothing to joke about. So it's not surprising how dark and even desperate Jewish humour can be and how the laughter it generates is so often based on a savage inversion, a turning upside down of normal expectations. We can think, for example, of Mel Brooks's famously black comment. Tragedy, he said, is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die. <laughs> There are other special features of Jewish humour, and the Marx Brothers illustrate these in particular. One is the ear for language, the importance of the word. Jewish humour is full of wordplay. For example, Groucho's one-liners and his terrible puns. And Seinfeld and M.A.S.H., these comedy series are full of the wittiest and most argumentative dialogue. There's a real love of language here, of the spoken word, which is very much part of Jewish culture and the Jewish oral tradition. When we ponder the importance of language in the Jewish tradition and the love of wordplay that's rooted in the Talmud, the key texts of Judaism, we might reasonably see them as the people of the word. By comparison, I think Christians might be regarded as the people of the word made flesh. We're indeed conscious, of course, of how the Old Testament paved the way for the new. But it's intriguing to consider how the humour of the Jewish people provides hints of the incarnation, of God seeking and finally consummating a greater intimacy with his people. Two scholars, Hershey and Linda Friedman, have argued in a book called God Laughing, the Jewish humour may, may serve to bring God closer to his creatures, as though he were foreshadowing, this is my interpretation, not theirs, through the history of the chosen people, that he will finally seek a closer union, in which humour as well as seriousness will reveal his mysteries more fully and more profoundly. You might recall the final moments of uh, one of Chesterton's plays called The Surprise, in which uh, the first part of the play, uh, the lines that have been written by the playwright, who's up in the wings, uh, uh, were delivered by puppets, and the script was faithfully adhered to. It was an interval, and in the second part of the play, the puppets were replaced by human actors, 
who naturally thought they could make some adaptations, leave out some of the lines that weren't really necessary, add some that they thought would be have, have a greater effect. And as they proceeded to change what the playwright had done, uh, the playwright stands up in the wings and calls out, Stop! I'm coming down. And more than one scholar has pointed out this is Chesterton's great image of the incarnation. One Jewish joke, for example, suggests that the only limitations that God has are self-imposed, and those are to protect the freedom of will that he has bestowed on us. In the late 1970s, President Jimmy Carter and Egyptian President Omar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin met at the presidential retreat of Camp David in the United States. Suddenly a heavenly voice called out, in reward for your efforts towards peace, you may each ask me any one question and I will answer it. So President Carter went first. Dear God, he asked, when will we have a nuclear free world? In the year 2048, God replied. President Carter began to cry. Why do you cry, asked God. Not in my administration, sobbed Jimmy Carter. Egyptian President Sadat asked his question. Dear God, when will my Arab brothers finally be united? In the year 4004, God replied. And then Sadat began to cry. Why do you cry, asked God. Not in my administration, replied Sadat. Then it was Prime Minister Begin's turn. Dear God, when will Israel finally begin to get fair treatment in the world media? And then God began to cry. <laughs> Dear God, Begin asked, why do you cry? And the Lord replied, not in my administration. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suspect that Michael Danby, the Jewish MP in Melbourne, might find that joke perversely appealing, given all that he's had to endure in the media in recent days. Well, let me move on to compare very briefly Jewish and Christian humour. The Jewish people is the people of the word, Christians is the people of the word made flesh. Christian humour contains some of the darkness and hard edges of the Jewish tradition. Jewish and Christian humour, after all, share a common heritage. They have both, at different times, been a persecuted people and both see human beings as put deeply imperfect and in need of salvation. But Christian humour is perhaps more positive and playful, a little less harsh, somewhat more accepting in a spirit of hope of human nature and its weaknesses. I'd suggest this comes from the Christian belief in the Incarnation, the God of the New Testament, the person of Christ, and the intimacy that we have with a God who took on our own human nature and identifies with our sufferings directly and in person. A God of mercy who saves rather than condemns. So Christian humour, it seems to me, is less savage, less self-deprecating, rather more balanced and hope-filled. There's another feature of Jewish humour that I think is worth highlighting, and that is the Jewish perspective on society, which is from the outside. Much of its sharpness comes from being so often excluded. Historically, the Jewish people have never been able, except perhaps in recent times in the state of Israel, to exercise power in conventional ways, such as political and especially parliamentary power, social dominance or military might. The Jews have relied on alternative sources of power, reason and argument, wit, wit and humour. As the oppressed, they have used humour to demonstrate their superiority over the oppressor. Finally, they show the vision of Hans Christian Andersen, the emperor has no clothes. And this is the way of the Marx Brothers. As the British Catholic writer Paul Johnson once pointed out, the Marx Brothers provided an underdog view of the world of convention since that is the way the Jews have always seen majority society. They are the quintessential outsiders, he said, 
who have coped with this by mocking themselves as outsiders, as well as others who are insiders. Somehow self-deprecation enhances their own image as a group and gives them a certain licence to deride other groups, those who control and dominate society. In the words of the Jewish-American comedian Roseanne Barr, if you make fun of your own, she said, in front of the dominant culture here, you could live next door to them. And occasionally, just occasionally, the outsider wins. We think of the man in Belfast one night during the Irish Troubles who suddenly felt the barrel of a gun in his back. And the gunman says, are you a Catholic or a Protestant? I'm neither, says the man. I'm Jewish. The gunman bursts into laughter. What's so funny, asks the man. And the gunman replies, I must be the luckiest Arab in all of the world. <laughs> <laughs> the creator of the TV series Bash, Larry Gilbert, I mentioned earlier, has said that his Jewishness has always influenced his script writing. Everything I do, he said, is tinged with the Jewish perspective as the outsider in American culture, the observer ready with a caustic or witty observation when you're lucky, someone on the defensive. Comedy, says Gilbert, is a sword and a shield. And we, the Jews that is, have often needed both as a people. To quote Mel Brooks again, one of my lifelong jobs, he says, has been to make the world laugh at Adolf Hitler. Because how do you get even? There's only one way to get even. You have to bring him down with ridicule. The late Robin Williams, who regarded himself as an honorary Jew because of the parts he played and uh, his style of humour, even though he was raised a Christian, he was once asked in an interview in Germany, Mr Williams, why do you think there is not much comedy in Germany? <laughs> and Williams answered, did you ever think you killed all the funny people? <laughs> in Hogan's Heroes, it's Hogan, played by the Catholic Bob Crane, who repeatedly refers to Hitler as scrambled brains, while it's Colonel Klink, played by the Jewish Werner Klepperer, who answers indignantly, but this is our beloved Führer. <laughs> well, I'd like to finish with two questions and a Chesterton quote, which actually amplifies one that uh, was provided in a shortened form earlier. The first question is a speculation. Could Chesterton have featured in a Marx Brothers movie? And if so, which one? My only thought is the playwright in the 1938 movie Room Service, in which the Marx Brothers are trying to get a stage play produced and funded while evading paying the bill at the hotel where they're staying. <laughs> but since this movie was made two years after GK died, uh, this doesn't look promising. And in any case, whether Chesterton might have outwitted, in the literal sense, Groucho Marx, there's probably another reason he didn't appear in a Marx Brothers movie. The second question is an historical one. Which Marx would you prefer to have dinner with? And Edmund touched on this earlier. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, or Groucho Marx, the founder of madcapism? The French have an expression, je suis marxiste, tendance, Groucho, if you'll allow my poorly remembered school French. This translates as, I am a Marxist of the Groucho variety. <laughs> In the 1960s and later, this line spread beyond France to many other nations. And certainly when I have over the years thought of myself as a Catholic Marxist, I certainly was referring to Groucho, not to Karl. Well, allow me to finish, ladies and gentlemen, with a passage of Chesterton's uh, that will be well known to many of you and has, as I say, at least in part, been already uh, mentioned, and is, um, is a fascinating and provocative one. It's right, I think, to finish with a rousing passage from Chesterton. And this particular one is, like some of the passages in Orthodoxy as well as other books, uh, reminds me of what um, 
Frances Chesterton once said about her husband, there are times where Gilbert loves to throw red paint everywhere, and there's buckets of it in various parts of, uh, of orthodoxy and elsewhere. But this uh, conclusion to his book, Orthodoxy, pinpoints, I think, why humour is quintessentially human, and also in the light of how God made us quintessentially divine. A dear friend of mine, uh, uh, Dominican priest, Father Aquinas a. McComb, died recently in Melbourne, uh, and I can remember having discussions with him one time in Armidale when he was the dean of the residential college there, uh, St Albert's College at the University of New England, and, and somebody trying to explain their weakness uh, in a public setting just said, I'm only human. And uh, Father McComb said, well, you're not actually, you're also divine. Well, here's Chesterton at his most stirring and exhilarating. He writes, Joy, which was the small publicity of the pagan, is the gigantic secret of the Christian. And as I close this chaotic volume, he's talking about uh, his book Orthodoxy, I open again the strange small book from which all Christianity came, and I am again haunted by a kind of confirmation. The tremendous figure which fills the Gospels towers in this respect as in every other, above all the thinkers who ever thought themselves tall. His pathos was natural, almost casual. The Stoics, ancient and modern, were proud of concealing their tears. He showed them plainly on his open face at any daily sight, such as the far sight of his native city. Yet he concealed something. Solemn supermen and imperial diplomats are proud of restraining their anger, perhaps especially in a media-saturated age like ours, which penalises any emotion except tears. He, Chesterton said, speaking of Christ, never restrained his anger. He flung furniture down the front steps of the temple and asked men how they expected to escape the damnation of hell. Yet he restrained something. I say it with reverence. There was in that shattering personality a thread that must be called shyness. There was something that he hid from all men when he went up a mountain to pray. There was something that he covered constantly by abrupt silence or impetuous isolation. There was some one thing that was too great for God to show us when he walked upon our earth. And I've sometimes fancied it was his birth. Thank you very much. Thank you.